Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 79, Oldies But Goodies, talking about older games that are still worth playing. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we are dusting off some classics and talking about older and potentially out-of-print games that may be worth hunting down and at least getting to play. Also, in the game room, we're talking about Medium. Uh, my review went live today on the blog, and that also means our giveaway went live today. But more on that later during our announcement section. Now, when we get to the Bellhops tabletop section, I've got another play of Raiders of the North Sea with Hall of Heroes. Uh, we played some Gold West with four players, had another successful game of Medium, and played Terra Mystica with one of our patrons. Finally, I tried Clans of Caldonia for the first time. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folks. We'll share some of our some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Our first comment comes to us from Evan Edwards, and it's about our board game solution for the miniature gamer who doesn't want to collect an army anymore. Slash me looks at metal shelving full of canvas memoir 44 bags full of units, and then back at this list. Yeah. I suppose you don't have to collect armies. <laughs> well, thanks, Evan. Uh, this is true of so many of these games, actually. Um, I think this is the main reason these miniature game companies like Privateer Press and, and Games Workshop put out skirmish games. Because you start off small with all you need is five units, but then you always want more. And before you know, you're back to collecting armies again. Well, sticking with the same topic, David writes some other suggestions. Nuts by Two Hour War Games is a great set of WW2 rules that you can use any plastic minis to play. It is designed for solo play in Emperor 2. Army Men Combat is rules for using, well, Army Men. And Going More Future is Ogre and GEV from Steve Jackson Games, and they recently reprinted a full model version if chit play is not your thing. Wow, War Gamers sure like their acronyms there's a lot of them there um thanks for the comment david nuts sounds like that game you mentioned whatever that episode the the foobar system right where you could use anything to play any pretty much in any world so that sounds kind of cool uh games to play army men with there's probably a hundred of those out there we'll be sure to throw in this specific recommendation now ogre there's one i didn't think of uh when we were doing the list that is a good call that could be a fun one for a tank lover too because the actual topic during the day we were answering a question where specifically the person was into tanks. The cool thing about Ogre, if you're into tanks, is one side of that game plays one big tank, and the other side plays a bunch of other units trying to stop it. That's the whole theme with Ogre, and Ogre is the giant tank. And that's in the base game, and I know there's other scenarios, and GEV adds more rules and stuff like that. I've actually got a copy of Ogre. Um, I've got the huge designer edition, which is in my pile of shame. Well, actually, it's so big, it's pretty much its own pile of shame that's on a different part of the game room. All right, well, Woody X has a five-player game suggestion. Space-based is my main go-to. I had to Vassal recommend it when I met him once and doesn't disappoint. It has a lot of the dice-rolling resource gains that you get with Settlers of Catan, but without that pesky kingmaker trading. I'm trading in Catan being kingmaking. I can kind of see that. I, it's more King Unmaking, where you stop trading with the person who's leading. To me, that's a feature of the game. But thanks for the comment, Woody. Uh, Space Base, I got to try this game. Like, I really do. Everyone keeps telling me this is the best dice-based resource generation tableau building game out there, where you get 
the the cards, you roll the dice, they generate the resource to buy more cards. I love that genre. And everyone keeps trying to tell me this kills Valeria, and I'd like to see it, because I love Valeria. So the game that kills Valeria, I'm going to love. All right, well, Andy's got another five-player game suggestion. He says simply, you forgot Spartacus. Fair enough. Uh, thanks, Andy. The problem with Spartacus is I haven't played it. I usually try to avoid... Excuse me. Doing that while recording a podcast. I usually try to avoid games. I'm not, I haven't personally played when making these lists. Uh, there was a ton of hype out there for Spartacus when it first came out. And I know a, loco, lo, a group of local gamers uh, led by Ross, who were really into that game for a while. But I gotta admit, I haven't heard much since. What did happen with that game quickly is it quickly went out, to, went out of print. Like they put it out, people loved it, people played it, and they just never kept it up. So, it's a little little hard to find nowadays, and I don't see any way I'm going to get a chance to play that one since the original group I was speaking of kind of moved on to other games. It, I do hear it's really good, so we will throw that in the, the comments so that other people can check it out. All right, well, our final comment this week comes from Rick Alvarado, who commented on our last Gloomhaven actual play video on YouTube. Perfect setup now. I've searched YouTube for Gloomhaven playthroughs, and this is the best-looking one now. Hard to find you, though. I am so glad to hear that the changes we've been making, both to uh, camera angles, lighting, and the way we've kind of zoomed in on the action, and we're now showing our cards, and the fact we've added um, Gloomhaven Helper on the side, it is awesome to hear that people are appreciating this. Now, as for the hard-to-find part, um, there's not much we can do. We try to SEO our stuff as best as possible. We follow all the, the tips and tricks for getting found on YouTube. But what would help us the most is if we had more views and subscribers. So if you haven't checked out any of our YouTube content, or if you checked it out before and it looked a little shabby, it looks a little better now, it'd be awesome if you headed over there sometime in the next week, checked out what we're doing, and make sure you hit that subscribe button before you leave. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. All right, tonight we are talking about older and potentially out of stock, out of print games. Out of stock, out of print, out of print, and out of stock if you go to try to find them. Uh, what I want to know from The Lobby is what are your favorite older games? What's a classic that you wish would be reprinted? Or something you actually went and chased down, something that like a grail game that you managed to get a copy of, something you bothered to take the time to hunt down and purchase, probably at a stupid price. Or if you got a great deal on an old game, we'd love to hear about that too. There's uh, there's a lot of uh, bargain hunters out there scouring their local, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, thrift stores, thrift stores, yeah. and, 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 and yard stores. secondhand stores and yard sales out there. I see a lot of that on uh, Twitter. So there's definitely some gamers out there who know how to find those old Nattlehead oh, yeah. games for a steal. Uh, unfortunately, I also saw some stories recently. Uh, someone who runs a high school role-playing group, um, they found a copy of 007 and Marvel superheroes at a wow. thrift store. But unfortunately, they were woefully incomplete and yeah. overpriced, even if they had been complete. So... Yeah. You do have to you do have to know your stuff if you're going to be picking up this stuff. You can't just see the box and dive on it. As someone who spent five years selling retro toys on eBay, I know all about <laughs> thrifting and making sure stuff is complete. Yeah, I don't even know if five years is right. Dan will probably click me in the chat. It was around then. We we used to have a an eBay store. It was what we did for, for supplemental income when we were both in our university days. And we spend a lot of time at thrift stores. And the big thing is know what you're looking for, know the going price, and make sure it's complete. Yep. And you know what? If they're really willing to sell you something, they'll be willing to open it up so you can check it. Yep. Yeah, my best, this is a good AMA question, actually. My best um, thrift find ever was a copy of the Marvel version of Heroescape. Now, not Hero Clicks, Heroescape. Heroescape was a hex based miniature war game. Uh, where you built the battlefield out of plastic pieces, and it looked fantastic. And they had the, the original game, the point was supposed to be like the Duel of Aeons or something. And it was, you had ninjas, and you had pirates, and you had dinosaurs, and you had space marines, and they could all battle each other, and it worked. And that was kind of their selling point, was that you can make an army out of anything. 
speaking of army collecting. Well, they put out a Marvel version with, you know, Spider-Man, the Hulk, Captain America and everything. Well, I found a copy of the Marvel edition for three bucks. And that, that was my biggest find for, for anything. And Heroescape nowadays, that Marvel set's probably worth a fortune. Because yeah. Heroescape, unfortunately, because the amount of plastic in it, once the price of plastics went up, Hasbro was like, oh, hell no, we can't keep this up. There's no way. <laughs> so they did put out a new version, which was Magic the Gathering Arena of the Planeswalkers, which literally came with two hexes of plastic, and that's it, compared <laughs> to build a battlefield. And it was to give you a little hill in the middle of your battlefield. Like, it was such... And that crashed and bombed, but both because every time they try to make a board game out of Magic, it fails. And the fact that anyone who did play the original was just kind of like, oh, come on, what'd you do? <laughs> right. Well, we uh, had some coffee chat earlier. Uh, Deanna was mentioning that uh, that ogre game uh, doubles as a coffee table and what, until you get it, it, it off could've... the pile of shame. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely a monster of oh, a box. Is. It is not so. It would take up our whole backdrop if we were to bring that up and uh, oh, seriously. put it in the back of the camera. I don't think it would fit on the table without like moving some of the minis. Yeah, and... no, it's it's a beast. That's for sure. It's it's, it's probably about this tall too. <laughs> Nuts. NVTS. All right. Well, we'll check back in with the lobby after our main topic. Coming right up. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and click on ask the bellhop social media works too we're everywhere as tabletop bellhop one word now the best way for questions to get to us is through the website that way nothing gets lost and it goes in my inbox and it's nice and tracked and sorted i'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere well tonight question comes from the tabletop bellhop blog ashley rabum writes I just started listening and I'm going through the back catalog and I'm loving it. I do have a question though. It's kind of two questions, but I think they're related. What are some older slash out of print games that you would recommend tracking down? And two, are there any games with older editions in which the older edition is worth holding on to, tracking down, or better than the more recent edition? Well, thanks so much for listening, Ashley. Uh, it's cool that you're going back to the backlog, though I do apologize for our audio quality and stiltedness during some of our earlier episodes. There is some great content back there, though. Yeah, we do keep trying to improve our quality in various ways, and the structure of those early shows is so very different as well. But there is some good content in those early Ask the Bellhop segments if you can suffer through the freshman episodes. Yeah, there's some stuff I wish we hadn't answered back then, like best two-player co-ops. We like, we could do so much better now. It'd probably be the same list of games. We just do a better job. So we're going to start off with the first part of Ashley's question, where they're looking for older out-of-print games that we recommend seeking out and tracking down, order or out-of-print or both and or. Uh, the second part, though, about games that um are better, where the old versions are better, we'll get back to later, because i got to think about that one for a bit, because I know there are some out there. I got a couple in mind, but I may be able to come up with some more. Maybe the chat room can help me out with that. Well, luckily, the uh, as we as we say here, we're not about the new hotness. So the yeah. bellhop really is the one to answer these questions about some older games that uh, you know still hold their own on the table. Yeah, because you know what? Despite the fact there are a crazy number of new games releasing every year, um, I mean, we knew the numbers from two years ago. I don't know the numbers this year. From what I hear, it's actually down, but it's still like over five thousand games. It's, it's ridiculous. And all of the gaming media out there, whether it's podcasts, blogs, uh, video on demand, whatever, YouTube, everyone seems to be dedicated to the latest and greatest. Whatever the, the hot Kickstarter is right now or the games that are coming out in Essen 2021. Longtime listeners of the show probably know, and as Sean just alluded to, we're, we've never really been all about the new hotness. Now and then we get lucky. We've got something like medium we're going to be talking about later. That's, that's pretty cutting edge for us, right? Now and then it happens, but you know what? I, I don't care about the new hotness myself. I, I don't need to have a, the brand new game right now. What I am a big proponent of is playing good games. Any good game. Good games don't have a date stamp on them. Well, I can't deny it. there are some great games coming out, and I fully admit there'll probably be some amazing games released this year and next year and the year after, some truly great games stay great forever. Yeah, I was actually a bit frustrated on Twitter yesterday, big shock, 
as I saw someone <laughs> asking about inspir asking people for inspiration by naming what new hot games they were playing. And I just wanted to shout, what about the thousands of other games that come out every year that may be fantastic, except everyone ran past them because the next day something newer and hotter came out. Yeah, there there was a time when when content creators like me, like people, Tom Vassell remembers this time period. He's been at this way longer than we have, where you could theoretically play all the games. And he's saying not all, like like certain ones, like don't step on it, you can skip those. But like all of the potentially good hobby games, there was a time period. That's impossible now. You are going to overlook something. I think now I need to do a Pepperidge Farm remembers meme about Tom Vassell, though. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. The main problem with older games, as Ashley notes, though, is that they too tend to go out of print, which does drive some of this drive for the new hotness, right? Heck, some of the new games go out of print. Now, Tom Vassell, again, we're going to bring him back up. I guess we're talking about Tom a lot tonight. You know who Tom Vassell is, I hope. He's probably the biggest name in board game media. He has a, a law, and he, he coined it himself. I have my own law. He's got his law. And his law is any game that is good will not remain out of print and will eventually be available. So the question is, if it's out of print, is it worth finding? Yeah. And we'll get to some hints on that. Now, for Tom Vassell's law, he has been proven to be right. Like, at first when I heard him say this, I'm like, no, because you know what? Agiza is one of my favorite games. If I had done this episode that we're doing right now, I would have been talking all about Agizia, the top game on my list. Oh, their game, you got to get it. It's amazing. Track it down. Pay 80 bucks for it. It's worth it. You might even want to pay more. And of course, Dark Tower, the grail game of almost every hobby gamer, everyone who grew up in the 80s, anyone who's seen the thing in real life, right? As of right now, Agizia was just reprinted at the end of 2019 by Stronghold, Stronghold Games, put it out, and you know what? Dark Tower is coming out this year. So Vassal's Law, in effect, right there, like two of the biggest games for me that, that I never thought we'd see again, and here they are. But it's not universal. There are definitely games out there that will never be reprinted. Some of them, great. As for games, we're going to mention below, it's going to be a mix. Once we get into a game recommendations, they're all going to be old. Some will still be in print, but some will be sadly no longer available. After all, every law has its exceptions that prove it. Yeah, and that is what Tom used to say every time someone said, Bark, Dark Tower! And he's like, but the exception that proves the rule. Now he has to pick another game. <laughs> Now, in regards to these out-of-print games, we did an entire episode about tracking down rare and hard-to-find games where we recommended some places to look you may not be aware of. If there's a game we mentioned today you can't find, jump back to that episode and maybe we can hook you up. All right, well, ep uh, episode 56 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Treasure Hunt. Find it on the Tabletop Bellhop blog or wherever you prefer to get your podcast. All right, one final thing before we start. Uh, Ashley didn't specify what they meant by older. Uh, this changes. In the industry, in an industry with over 5,000 games coming out every year, some people consider three years old games a classic. I saw that today. Miniature Mart is having a sale on classic games, and they did this like old school, white washed out sepia newspaper, and on it is like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game. I'm like, come on. Like that, they're not like the old has. This is the, the modern new one that was like that kickstarted two years ago. I personally want to go back. I want to go way back. I'm going to set our definition of older games here for tonight's episode to be games that came out before the turn of the century. So from 1999 back. No, this is going to knock out a lot of games I consider true classics. Surprisingly, games that are, are not quite that old, like Puerto Rico, Power Grid, Alhambra, Carcassonne, those all came out after Y2K. Well, on to the game recommendations. We're going to start with the board game. All right, number one, everyone probably knows this one. I'm sure you expected this on the list from the start of the episode, and that is Settlers of Catan, which nowadays is just known as Catan Trade Build Settle. Uh, this was published in 1995. But it didn't really hit here in North America until about the year 2000. Uh, it's still one of the best design games out there. Like, I honestly think it is. It's a combination of resource generation, building things on a map, and trading between players really helped build the Euro game, the German game, the designer game as a genre. The whole ho hobby board gaming hobby 
I, it really does owe itself in North America to Catan. We still play Catan. I'll admit, not as much as we played 20 years ago, but it still gets broken out. Now, I have to say, for me personally, while Catan is a classic, and I absolutely respect its place in board game history, I could do without ever playing it again. It's, it's one of those games that comes out every once in a while, and, you know, I'll sit down and play it, but it struggles to really capture my attention anymore in the world of, of games we have, and, and games that have, uh, you know, old, even older games from the mm -hmm. time. Um, you know, again, it, it did something for the gaming market that is, you know, unmistakable, and, and it needs to be recognized, and it shouldn't be thrown out. I mean, it needs to be, it needs to be there, but... Yeah, it's it's not going to be the first of a, a game I have to pick uh, anytime. See, I'm 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 in the other boat. Even writing this, I'm like, you know what? I need to bring out the easy mode is Catan because it's a classic. Everyone knows it. It's quick to play. I'm not going to have to teach people to play it, and it's great for new gamers. And I still do enjoy playing Catan. One of these days, I'm going to find a counter for Deanna's strategy. I know what Deanna's strategy is, and I know one way to stop it, but I have to find a different strategy that works. Because she seems to have not broken Catan, but she's found a, a particular strategy that if people don't notice, it tends to work. And I've been trying to find a counter strategy, which isn't just stop her from doing that. So I still play Catan this this many years later. I still enjoy it. I've, I'll still bring it out to events. Up next, I've got El Grande. Uh, this also was published in 1995. 1995 was a, a bumper year, actually, for, for hobby board games. At this point, you can find the 10th anniversary edition as well as a more recently released big box edition, both surprisingly cheap. I personally own the 10th anniversary edition, and I have said, I've mentioned this game on the podcast many times. I use this as an example anytime I talk about area majority. This game still is the most pure area majority game I've ever played. Everyone starts with the same hand of cards, and you have to use those cards to move your cubes around the map and make the most points over multiple scoring rounds, all based on who has the most cubes where. Yeah, no, it's it's hard to go wrong when when you're looking at the the pure uh, mechanic games. Yeah, and these are the games that started it, right? Like I'm sure that like Risk is technically area majority, but like as far as I know, this is the first game where you're getting points for coming in second and third, based on your your folk on the map or the, your cubes on the map. That was El Grande. Up next, I've got Ra. This was the game that got me to love auctions and board games. Before playing Raw, if someone said, oh, it's a game with an auction, that sounded so boring to me or so not interesting or frustrating because you never know how much to bid. Uh, where Raw does auctions in a unique way that just clicked. This one was originally released in 1999, so it just kind of slips under the radar, under our, our time limit. It was re-implemented in 2009 as Priests of Raw, which I had got mixed reviews. But then Asmodee, and I think because Priests of Raw got mixed reviews, came back out with a new printing of the original. So this one's back on the market, can be picked up. I saw the original printing. Um, I'll admit it's been a little while since this one's hit my table, but I still dig it. I still like it. The unique auction system where you're given three numbers to bid with instead of having to pick numbers out of your head, combined with the push-through-luck mechanic, which I got to say, there aren't many Euro games where you have a push-through-luck element. That's an interesting mix that I really enjoy. Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about uh, power power grid auctions, yeah. but uh, there were auctions long before that. Uh, and unlike, uh, you know, the, the terrifying auction mechanic of, say, Monopoly, this yes. one works and this is good. This is an auction you shouldn't be terrified of. I totally agree. So that was Raw. All right. Another one from the late 1990s this is from 1998. That is Samurai. Uh, this is a Rainier Nitzia game. This name's going to come up a lot on this list. This is, um, nope, this is the 1998 version, not the reprint of Akuza or Samurai Swords, the old Avalon Hill game. This is an abstract strategy game, um, math, very math based. Like, what else would you expect from Nizia? It's abstract strategy with math. He pretty much kind of signed his name on that. Uh, set on the Isles of Japan. And what's interesting is based on the number of players, you use a different number of islands, which is really cool. Um, you're putting out a bunch of little tokens out on the board, and it's a hex map, and you're going to play units next to those, and they're in numbers. And then whoever plays the majority of the number tiles gets to take the token off the map. Uh, you can find the original Rio Grande printing out there. If you can find that, that's the one to pick up. This is one, if like, it's a really solid game if you like those mathy Euro games. 
And the components of the original are just so much better than the late, later printed Fantasy Flight did a copy. And they replaced everything with plastic, and it's just not as cool and tactile. It's not the same. So this is one where I actually do recommend the original version of the game if you can find it. A great abstract game that, that almost everyone I show it to actually really digs. And again, this is Samurai 1998, yes. not the 1996 version, and which is a completely different Samurai. So yeah, Samurai 1998. Uh, Fantasy Flight Games has the current uh, yeah. um, version. That is correct. That was Samurai. Next, we have the oldest game on this list tonight. Uh, this is Acquire. Originally released in 1964, uh, by famous game designer Sid Saxon. This is all about business investments and stock manipulation. Now, the killer app in this game is the fact that businesses are represented abstractly by tiles on a grid, and they grow and form across the board, and if two sets of tiles touch, that represents a merger. And then there's a whole economic where your stakeholders get paid out and everything like that. It is really well done. Um, despite what sounds like a ridiculously dry theme and the fact that games from the 1960s, this is still one of the best economic games ever made. Still worth playing. This is one that should be on your list to try at some point, Sean, just because it's such a classic. And like, I was shocked I enjoyed it. Like I knew there were groups that enjoyed it and I sat down and I looked at it and it looks so dry and the, the components are, are are older, right? Like you got paper money and, and the business tiles look like, um, they remind me of Battleship because they say like H2, H3, H4, but that's where they go on the grid when you place them. It just, oh, but it's so good. Like it, it really is. Yeah, no, this is this is absolutely a classic. Um, there may actually even have been a copy of this that I was terrified of in my parents' collection back in the day. Yeah, uh, I would because know they it. they did they did play games like this, but it was one of those. It was it was the games that you know were adults only and and were mm -hmm. sort of kept separately from all the games that yep, yep. you know the general role and moves that the kids played. So again, that's Acquire. Yeah, that was by 3M Games. There are more modern versions, components a little better than the original, but there are, I, as far as I know, it's still in print by someone. Uh, Avalon Hill has got a, has, or has had a license. I don't know if they're the current one. Yeah, I don't know if they still are. Avalon Hill, which is Hasbro, so. Yeah. Up next, I got Lost Cities. We talked about this one fairly recently. Uh, this is another Rainier Nitzia classic that just makes the Y2K cutout. Coming out in 1999, actually late 1999, I have been in love with this two-player card game since discovering it in the game pile at the coffee exchange downtown. Uh, Deanna and I used to actually meet downtown and play it on her lunch break when she worked at the library. So this is going back. Um, just make sure when shopping for this one, this even as much as Samurai, make sure you get the right game because there is Lost Cities, the board game, which you don't want. And there's Lost Cities Rivals, which we've talked about on a recent podcast, which is a four-player version. I hate to say it, but you don't want those. You just want the two-player card game, the original one. It was originally released by Cosmos. I'm not sure who currently has the rights on that one. Yeah, unfortunately, Lost Cities Rivals uh, kind of fell pretty flat uh, when, yeah. we, when we got that on the table. But uh, Lost Cities, again, and you're your classic. Yeah. Um, you want Lost Cities, the card game, not the board game, even though... It's hard to tell them apart. I apologize. That's the uh, blame Thames and Gosmo for that one. Up next comes my biggest surprise being on this list because I, of course, came up with a bunch of games in my head and a whole bunch of them came out in 2002, 2003, 2004. And I'm like, wow, not Power Grid, not this, not that. This game was the opposite because I would have never put this on the list until going through and I found a Board Game Geek Top 100 list of pre-1999. And sitting near the top of that list was Pitch Car. I had no clue that this game came out in 1995. Like, I, I just assumed it was a much more modern game. Uh, I was shocked by that. Now, I've mentioned Pitch Car, I don't know how many times on this show. It's pretty much, if I can slip in a dexterity game, I'm going to mention Pitch Car. Uh, it is my second favorite. I'm not going to mention the first one, just because we mentioned that one a little too often, too. Uh, this is Crokino on a racetrack. Yep. No, absolutely. It's It's a fun game. Easy to play, easy to learn, always gets people's attention for its look and its and its play. Can't go wrong with Pitch Car if you can afford it and you can store it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just the base game doesn't take up too much room. Just one box, but you start picking up the expansions like I did. And, and Pitch Car is so well supported. A new expansion came out last year. Like it's it's still going. Eagle Griffin owns the rights to that one here in uh, North America. And it's and it, it even has expansions that came out in your time period. Like it's yes. 
It just keeps keeps giving yeah. it. Yeah, it's a fantastic game. Again, that's Pitch Car. Up next, I've got Chinatown. Now, this is one I missed. This is one that originally came out in 1999. I heard amazing things about this game. I almost came really close to paying, you know, one of those eighty to one hundred and twenty dollars prices for it because I kept hearing that it is so good. You got to get Chinatown. Your collection's not complete without Chinatown. But it finally got reprinted by Z-Man Games, and I was able to pick up a copy at that time. I paid full price for it, which is saying something for me, and it was well worth the rate. This is like the El Grande of negotiation games. This game is just pure negotiation. Here's a map of Chinatown. You get five businesses. You get 5000 bucks. You own five properties. Next player's got the exact same thing. What do you do? You're going to negotiate. You're trying to trade businesses. You're trading money. It is so well done, and it's again, in its purity, the same way that El Grande is. If you like bartering with your friends, you got to check out this game. Now, the problem with it is if you get into this game now, you're going to be like me back in whatever I tried to find it because it is out of print yet again and going for silly prices. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes uh, the classics need to, you know, just sort of cycle through and everyone gets it. And I find it happens a lot with these pure mechanic games, right? You've got this pure mechanic and it's it's really interesting, but it gets a little done and then other games will take that mechanic and and integrate it with other game, other mechanics to make a what you know in some people's opinion maybe a, be a better game and people prefer that because of the variety mm -hmm. until they've forgotten about the pure mechanic game and you know eight or ten years later all of a sudden everyone wants to try the pure mechanic and lo and behold here comes chinatown again mm -hmm. ready to uh deliver yeah this is one i do hope comes out again and vassal's lie hope is true for a third run on this one all right, up next is Bonanza, which was published in 1997. I was pretty sure this game was way newer than that, so I looked it up, and I didn't actually start playing myself until 2008. So this one took me a long time to find. In 2008, it was still fresh and new to me. Uh, this is another great trading game, kind of fun at all player counts. Uh, the neat part I found with this one, and Sean pointed it out, and it was what made me first think of it when we played on my birthday, is that you can play Bean casually, or take it ridiculously seriously. And both ways of playing are a ton of fun. And I've even seen a group with mixed types playing together and somehow it worked. Yep. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, on your, on your birthday last year, you yeah. were, you were taking it seriously. Oh yeah. You were kicking everyone's butts and no one else really cared. Um, <laughs> we were having fun. We were sort of pushing the limits of the rules. Um, and I think you probably would have had a little more fun if maybe a couple other people were taking it as seriously yeah. as you were. But it was, you know, it's just an enjoyable game, no matter how you're, uh, how you're playing it. Again, that's, uh, that's Bonanza. All right, Torres. This is another 1999. I, it's not like I was trying to keep as close to 2000 as possible. Just, man, 1999 was a good year for games. Uh, this was out of print for a ridiculously long time, even longer than Chinatown. Could not find a copy of this. I've got an original printing of it. It's back there. It's from Rio Grande Games. Uh, except for the fact it came in a really stupidly large box for what you get in it. I love this game. This is an abstract building game where you're moving your knights and then building levels of a castle. And there's rules about how high up you can join and how far down you can jump and who owns the towers and stuff like that. It's a fantastic looking game that draws people to the table. Uh, it scores over multiple scoring rounds and has a lot of math for what it is because your scoring is actually at the width of your tower times the height. Um, really neat game. If you played Santorini, Santorini is like the light version of this where you just have a little tiny building where you're trying to build up to the top. This is like Santorini for advanced gamers. I love this game. Now, this one has a new printing that just came out. I don't know if it's 2019, 2018, but I'm just starting to see it in sales. Uh, that has, looks a little better. It's a smaller box, and it replaced the Boring Pawns, because this is an old enough game that, you know, Meeple were, were, weren't were invented yet. There was no Carcassonne. They're, they had pawns, wooden pawns that looked like pawns. And now the new version, they're like, they look like little knights that are carved. They, they remind me of uh, the Viking chess pieces. And I'm like, oh, that looks so much cooler, except I already own Torres. I don't really want to rebuy it just for cool looking knights. But this is one that I think is worth picking up. You don't need to find the old version. Just pick up the new. So uh, the newest version I can find is actually 2017 reprint. Oh, it's older than I thought. Yeah. Okay. 
So that was uh, that's the uh, published by IDW Games, the English fourth edition, twenty seventeen. Okay. Fourth edition. Wow. Yeah. So maybe there were three editions in between. I don't know what edition mine is. So that is Torres, and uh, also I was noticing Chinatown had a twenty nineteen print. Is it already out of print? Like uh, done? Even though but you know what? Maybe when I was looking for it, it was early twenty nineteen. Uh, okay. I'd have to look. I, is there, so maybe this one's out. Maybe it's out there. Maybe so it China, Chinatown did have a 2019 edition that came okay. out. See, I'm trying to remember if when I saw it was... No, because I didn't get my copy in 2019. I got mine in 2017. So, right. yeah, so it has come out. So there you go. Fast as well. All right. Well, that what it's Chinatown, but also that last game was Torres. Yes. All right. Up next is a classic I know Sean's going to recognize. Uh, that is Space Hulk. I still remember the day I got White Dwarf number 113 back in 1989, which introduced the world to Space Hulk and Terminator Space Marines and Gene Steelers, the new threat to the Imperium. I got the game pretty much immediately thereafter. Um, we took a trip up to Toronto where there was a Games Workshop store just to get it. Uh, this is still, in my opinion, one of the best two-player Amerithrash style games out there. Like, even Deanna, who is a hardcore Euro fan, loves Space Hulk. Every random D6 rolling, p aliens popping out of the corners gameplay, one of the most thematic games out there. Every five to ten years or so, Games Workshop will put out some deluxe printing with new minis and glossy boards and all that. I, I did buy one of those. It's behind you back there. It was the first time they reprinted it. They're pretty. But I still love my originals 80s edition, especially with all the expansions and stuff that are out there. Yeah, no, my, uh, Space Hulk is is amazing. I still remember uh, the look of Gene Steelers when they came out because it was different enough than the Giger alien concept yeah. to with that insectoid uh, feel that just kind of had its own level of terrifying, different mm -hmm. different than the the uh, the Giger version of uh, an alien. So that was Space Hulk. All right, sticking with Games Workshop, how about Hero Quest? This is the other one that I assume everyone listening, everyone watching from home, however you're seeing it right now, expected to be on this list. This is one of the most famous games published in a partnership between Games Workshop and Milton Bradley. And due to that partnership and the fact those companies, Milton Bradley being gone, we'll never see this one reprinted again. Uh, people have tried and tried and tried. Uh, this hit markets worldwide in 1990, and at this point is one of the most sought-after board games for many gamers. I, I gotta admit, I got it back when it was new. Uh, I was into Warhammer already, so a Warhammer board game that looked, uh, you know, wasn't Games Workshop looked awesome. Um, so inside scoop, when Deanna and I were dating, one of the things we did together on dates was played through the original Hero Quest campaign. I'm always gonna have fond memories of this game, both for that reason and the fact that I just loved it before then. Uh, what I really should do is get my copy out, play with my girls. They haven't had to experience that one yet. Of course, I'm going to have to steal the scenery back because I've been using it for Gloomhaven. Uh, and this is one of those games where even though we may never get the real edition out again, um, those who do have it are, you know, suffer from a wealth of content because oh, yeah. so many supplements came out for this. And, you know, so many different magazines printed content for HeroQuest and just so much came out for it. But uh, if you do manage to lay your hands on a copy, there's a lot out there beyond what comes in the box. And that was Hero Quest. All right, up next, Primordial Soup. I have to thank uh, my friend Jamie for introducing me to this game. Uh, it's a, his favorite game of all time. Now, I didn't realize, this is another one, that until looking at uh, that list I mentioned earlier, that this is from 1997. I didn't think it was quite that old. So it does kind of explain the component quality. Uh, this is a fascinating game where you play a bunch of amoeboid organisms floating around the primordial soup, and you go around and feed on the poop of the other players, amoeboids. And as you feed on the poop, you improve your genes and slowly evolve your species. And you're trying to increase your population and your gene sophistication. Uh, it's a fascinating game with, I got to say, one of the most unique themes out there, even to this day, that I still greatly enjoy. Now, this one is long out of print, so I've been able to find copies of the base game, 
What I can't seem to find anywhere for a reasonable price is the expansion that was released. They only put out one, I think it's called Freshly Spliced. Spiced. And I can't find that anywhere for non-ridiculous prices. Like, I'm going to have to trade a copy of Hero Quest to get it. Yeah, so the year after, in 1998, they came out with Freshly Spiced, uh, the expansion. Um, and now, interestingly, the original game did have a reprint in 2004. Okay. Uh, and then the Primordial Soup had a reprint in 2007, both by Zed Man Games. Okay. Yeah, the version I have, I think, actually is New Z-Man. So right. For Zed Man. But since then, that's still, that's been 13 yeah, yeah. years now. It's still, so it's still quite a while ago, even before that. It's still quite a while ago since that one's been back. And that was Primordial Soup. All right, we talked about Settlers of Catan, but who had... The game with the plastic ships that you shook and flipped over to had little beads fall out to tell you how far you moved. And that was Starfarers of Catan. Uh, this was a huge grail game for a number of people for a very long time. Uh, this is another one, 1999. 1999 seems to be the year that hobby board gaming like just blossomed. It's been long out of print, only to see a fresh new release last year. 1990, they came out with a new copy of this. And I need to see it. I want to see it. I, I, I have the original. Um, it came out in 99. Um, I have the five to six player expansion for the original as well. Um, it is so much more than just Catan in space. And if you want Catan in space, you can get that. That's Star Trek Catan, where you use the same map and you have the Star Trek crew. This is completely different. You are upgrading a ship. There's a pick up and deliver element. You meet alien species to get special powers. Um, and then there's even a story element where if, when you fly through space, the person next to you grabs a card off a deck and gives you options. Very cool game. Uh, it's been my preferred way to play Catan for many, many years. Yeah, no, and uh, the, while the ships are not exactly the same, they are very, very similar. The pieces yeah. go on, all the, you know, the roll them over. Um, it's, it's, they've, they've stuck to it very well. The biggest thing is they've rebranded it. It's now Catan starfarer oh, rather than the starfarers of Catan because they've rebranded the entire Catan series yeah. in that same manner it's where it's Catan first and then you know pull in whatever else you you want to stack on the end which i always thought was weird because we never used to call it Catan. well it must work because now i do <laughs> but back in the day it was always settlers you want right. to play settlers you want yep. to get together and play some settlers we can play some settlers want to play some starfarers and that's how we talked about it well, it must have worked. The, the rebranding must have worked because I just realized this whole episode, I, I, except for mentioning that it was called Settlers. Yeah. The one problem is if you can find the classic edition, you, if you can find one in mint shape, like it'd be worth a fortune because those ships were made of a very fragile plastic and they break and every copy printed everywhere breaks. Eventually, they offered these plastic rings you could put over top of the broken ships so they could at least hold the engines. Uh, so if you can find a copy without broken ships, good on you. Mine are all broken. Every ship is broken. That was a known problem with the game back in the day. I even ordered replacement ships, and the replacement ships showed up, and they broke. Like, I don't know what the plastic they used. You had to notch in these little engines, and the clips broke off. Like, I, I don't have every clip on every ship isn't broken, right. but I don't have a single ship that is 100% complete. So in this case, you probably just want to seek out the new copy anyway. Yeah. That was Starfarers of Catan, or in the modern age, Catan Starfarers. <laughs> All right, up next, uh, Richard Garfield game, The Great Del Moody. This came out in 1995, two years after he released a slightly more popular card game, Magic the Gathering. Now, from my understanding, he actually designed Del Moody first, but couldn't get anyone to publish it. But then he got famous for putting out Magic, and he went, well, you let me put out Magic, how about I put out this card game? Uh, this is a ladder-based card game, which that's where you have to beat the last person's play of cards. It's basically a gamer's version of President, Vice President, or that other name for that game that I'm not going to say on the show because we're family-friendly. Uh, the neat bit here, though, is there are way more cards. You get 80 cards, and the neat thing is you have 12 12s, 11 11s, 10 10s, 9 9s, all the way down to 1 1, which is the great Del Moody card. There's some really fun mechanics here with the greater peon, the lesser peon, the lesser Del Moody, and trading cards. This is a fantastic large group, like up to eight player, uh, trick taking ladder card game. This is one my family loves, like the, the extended family. My aunts and uncles play this one for, with us. 
Now, uh, does the uh, Dilbert corporate shuffle stack up the same? It, it, it's apparently a re-implementation. The rules are identical. They just renamed the position. It's probably boss or president and vice president. And right. who, I don't know, probably to pee on and lesser <laughs> pee on. CEO sure. and secretary instead of, or something. Yeah, uh, something like that. I'm, I, from what I understand, it's a direct retain. Oh, that's good. So you admit that, that even that one's 1997 <laughs> yeah there's there's still way still way back there now great Dumb movie is still in print as far as i know uh you could get it at least a couple years ago it, oh. it just it's always the coast it's hasbro right like they they some of their classic games they can just keep putting them out <laughs> That's true. uh it looks like the last del moody edition i see uh 2016 but it also keep that's just a different version uh yeah still keep putting them out anyway as far as I understand, that one's still out there. And that was The Great Del Moody. All right, Corridor. This is a mass market abstract strategy game uh, that you used to be able to find in stores that sold puzzles, uh, pool tables, darts, stuff like that, or stores that sold desktop toys. Uh, the local stores that had it were Duffer and Game Room, and then the um, rather inappropriately named The Man Store at the mall from back in the day. Uh, where they sold to uh, mostly office furniture and desk trinkets, like, you know, desk golf and stuff like that. Uh, this was released in 1997 and is a fantastic-looking wooden abstract game. Just one of those games you leave out on your coffee table, kind of like having a chess set out, right? And then when people come over, you teach them to play. It's a really simple game where the only goal is to get your pawn from one side of the board to the opposite side, but there's all these walls that can be put in the way. In each turn, you either move your pawn one space or you move a wall, and that's pretty much it. It's dead simple to learn, but surprisingly deep in actual play experience. So uh, there's also a Corridor Kid that came out yep. uh, a few years later. It's uh, that broke the one thing. It's the same thing, but it's a uh, it's a smaller board and it's a much more bright and colorful version of the uh, yep. of the game. <laughs> not, not, your, not your executive hat. version. <laughs> yes. The executive version of Corridor. All right, All right. that was that was Corridor. With a Q. Yeah, Q U so O R I D O R. As far as I know, you can still get copies of that. It's 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 mass market games tend to be around. If you can't find Corridor, you'll be able to find a knockoff. That's definitely true of that one, which is somewhat unfortunate for the original designers. But it's one of those games where you can just find anywhere. All right, I have got one more. It's a longer list than it felt like it was when I was writing it. And that is Battletech. Uh, we're going to make Red Meeple Ryan here happy, and I didn't even plan for this. Uh, this is a classic hobby game from the 80s. Uh, 1985, to be exact, the, the original game was called Battle Droids and might have came out before that. But I'm thinking about my copy of Battletech. I still have it. It's back there. Uh, this is before the days of miniatures and plastic and everything. Mine has cardboard standees for your mechs. Um, well, the game has changed hands multiple times. It's no longer fast. It's gone to other companies. There have been multiple editions released over the years. Like, uh, we were trying to look this up the other day, and it was something like 11 different editions of Battletech have been released. What's really surprising is that the current rules, which are put out by Catalyst Game Lab, uh, are, like, surprisingly similar to the original. Like, they have changed almost not at all. The, the core system that FASA created, whoever the designer was of that, and it's bad on me to not know the actual designer of Battletech. It's probably a team. Hasn't really changed in 25 years, which that alone is a really good sign. Now, it's a war game that's going to take you a long time to play, and it's it's a game of points and building mechs and tracking little balls and filling in. Like it, It's a very different kind of game than most modern war games. But you know what? I don't do it often, but once, twice a year, I would love to get down and sit and play some Battletech. Yeah, so the uh, original design team is Jordan Weissman, uh, L.R. Butch Leeper, and Forrest Brown. Hey, Weissman, I've definitely heard that name before. I don't know if the other ones are still around. Yeah. So that was uh, Battletech. Yeah, Battletech's such a big license, you can still get it on Steam and play it that way nowadays. Like, it, it's definitely a thing. All right, I've got one honorable mention for this list, and that is Dune the Board Game. Now, this is an honorable mention because I haven't actually played this game to know if it lives up to the hype. But my God, is there a lot of hype for this game. It was released by Avalon Hill in 1979 and is considered by many hardcore gamers to be the be-all, end-all of asymmetric games. 
the the best board game ever produced for five players and so on. Uh, this game basically reached legendary status among gamers. It's like finding that copy of Hero Quest. No, it's it, it's bigger than that, right? It's been out of print, was out of print for like 40 years. It's just gone. You could not find this game. Everyone talked about it. Everyone told stories about their friend who had a copy or they knew someone or they talked about their epic games back in someone's basement, right? Well, that all changed literally this week because Gale Force Nines reprinted Dune should have showed up at your FLGS either yesterday or today. Both our local copy, both our local stores got in their copies this week. You can now go out, go to your local store, go online, pick up a copy of Dune and find out if it's all that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the new version is notably higher rated than the old ah. version. Uh, and I, I, I don't, honestly don't believe it i'm I'm sure it's a great game i I really i would like to get it uh get it on the table and play it i think it's it's got some interesting ideas and the way it's done asymmetry uh Mm -hmm. and it really is supposed to be a good game but there seem to be a whole lot of people who are uh you know doing the the upvoting thing and you know i spent money on it so it's got to be great problem that uh is is common right now so uh Right now, with over a thousand ratings, it's over eight point three, which wow. is a full point higher than the original. Game. Maybe so, it's maybe it's that good. It, it I might don't know. be. Like I said, but, it reached that it reached a legendary status, right? Like it, it exactly. was a god of games. It yeah. was it was an icon in the gaming industry. So, and I have I have a feeling that a lot of people are rating it high because they finally got their Grail game. I got a copy of Dune, <laughs> right? So uh, that was Dune as an honorable mention. Now, for me, yeah, I haven't played it. Couldn't tell you. For me, I don't really have too many classics that hold up to that harsh light of day. You know, there's a few games out there where it's like, oh, I remember that fondly, and but it comes out and you think, oh, wow, yeah, yeah. I was young, and and that game wasn't as good as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of my older games were uh, sixty from the sixties and seventies, and again, they were the kids' games. My parents had some of the games like Acquire that they played but uh the kids never even really saw those those were off on a different shelf uh and so we played a bunch of roll and move family games which were fun at the time but really can't compare to a modern hobby game or even a 20 year old hobby game as it turns (laughs) out um for me though for really you know back in 1993 there was magic the gathering uh and i dove in head first and spent far too much money on that game uh, and I just recently sort of delved back into it, dipping my toe in by getting the Arena app, which is available free. Um, and what it did is it rec- recalled some of the thrill I got of playing Magic and the the engagement with another player, even though it's, in this case it's digital. Um, but also, I find that, compare, it has evolved so much in the ensuing you know years that it really wasn't enjoyable and I'm, I'm playing it because i do and i, I it's, it's a habit but uh despite the fact that there are ample ways to spend money on this game they really want you to spend money mm-hmm. they aren't going to get a dime because the way the game has evolved is not enjoyable anymore uh what i would really love to do actually is is find a few people who have old decks like mine from back in the night in the late 90s and play them because mm-hmm. all the cards I have now, I'm sure, other than my lands, are legal. Um, so I'd only be able to play against other people who had cards from the late 90s. Um, there is a, a version of play that all the old stuff's still legal. I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, I would a, love, like... A number of, of strange versions. Yeah. And, and, and Oh, yeah, that's the other different. thing with Magic, is I don't know, they're, they're like, we're playing Champion, we're playing Two-Headed Giant, we're playing... I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I have no idea um this is something like man if if it only was last year i'd be like bring a deck down but unfortunately we have sold all our cards so i'm like i that was the thing i I, I would love to do is just like grab a deck that i built who knows how many years ago and sit down and play yeah i had the same experience i tried to get back into magic i still have friends who play tom barker who still plays uh, mike murphy plays tournament level and steve singleton had quit and is back into it so those are like three of the people who are part of my regular Monday night group that are definitely still involved. Oh yeah, no, in I mean, the magic scene. There's so. a lot of people who love it, and and I 
I don't fault the game at all. And I mean, they're doing something right. They're, you know, magic tournaments are a, a huge moneymaker and part of what is keeping the FLGS alive. And, well, yeah. and we want FLGSs in our community. So for that, more power to magic. But for me personally, uh, the idea where I could sit down and, and craft a deck out of, you know, however many cards I happen to have, and that would stand a chance against someone else's crafted deck even yeah. though I didn't have all the cards. Whereas right now there are card combinations and things that are just ridiculous. And if you don't happen to know it and have that card combination, odds are good that you're going to get smoked. I've seen some utterly ridiculous things happen in these games uh, with, with card combos that people have pulled out. And it's like, well, okay. It was fun while I was playing, but uh you just took 47 moves, played 62 cards, and I'm at negative 106 down. Wow. It's, yeah. That's just not fun. So, and again, I, I'm just literally play, build it, playing it the way I used to, right? I've, I'm like, oh, I want to make a vampire deck. So I build a vampire deck and I play it. Um, and that just doesn't work as well anymore. So that's fine. Still a solid game, though. So yep. I, I'd still recommend Like, Like, you want to talk about classic that has stood the test of time? Yeah. Like Magic the Gathering, 93 till now. Yeah. I uh, Possibly even more popular now than it was then. Yep. That's why it felt like everyone was playing it. Like, I just had to go to the local game stores on Friday night, and we didn't have crowds yep. like that. Oh, no, absolutely. The university. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it was, it was still, I mean, when we were involved, it was still a very new game. <laughs> yeah, it was. We got we, in, we got the in at the very start of Revised. Yeah. So Unlimited had just come out, or just ended, and Revised was literally brand new the weekend we bought our first decks. Yep. So. And so that was uh, Magic the Gathering, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. Uh, the next one, I've never actually played physically, but I can't stop playing it on Board Game Arena, and that's the 1980 classic, Can't Stop. Nice. It's a simple dice-based push-your-luck game that is implemented, you know, it's simple enough, but it can be great fun when you got a bunch of people who are just all into it. It's been implemented and re-implemented numerous times. It has 22 different uh -huh. editions, but... If you've got some dice and paper, all you really need. Uh, if you look on Board Game Arena, or sorry, on Board Game uh, Geek, you can see a huge selection of fantastic do-it-yourself and homemade yep. boards for this game that are almost inspiring into, you know, the level of mm -hmm. love people have for this game. Um, I've, I've played well over 100 games now in just since we've been playing BGA. That's another one. That's another Sid Sacks. Yep. So that's a, like I said, classic designer from the 60s and 70s. Yep, absolutely. Uh, that was Can't Stop. So next, we delve into RPGs. All right. I'm not going to go into nearly as many as I went to board games, but I wanted to cover all types of tabletop with this. And I just have huge nostalgia for some classic role playing games. So I wanted to bring them up. So this is me being a little more self serving here. Um, the one good thing about RPGs. I think I mentioned this later, don't I? You know what? I'll get into it later. All right. I forget my own show notes. So I'm going to start off. My number one, uh, one, and this is 100% me, the one I most want to seek out and I think is worth seeking out, and that is Ghostbusters 2 International. Unlike most RPG gamers, I didn't start with D&D. &D. Instead, my first RPG was Marvel Super Heroes from TSR. Now, I still love that game, and that's cool. It's okay. It kind of stood the test of time, but the game I want most is a copy of uh, Ghostbusters 2 International. This was released in 1989, and this was the second RPG I ever got to play. And it's one that I just never owned. I never had it myself. Uh, it was put out by West End Games, and it featured a light version and twisted, somewhat twisted version of their D6 system. Now, the reason I'm looking for Ghostbusters 2 and not Ghostbusters is after doing some research, it comes with more stuff, more cards, it's got some more sheets, and it's got like a Ghostbuster pledge and all this cool stuff. They slightly tweak the rules, and it's generally regarded to be a slightly better game than the original. So if I had to get one or the other, I'd rather have Ghostbusters 2 than the original game. That was Ghostbusters International, the RPG or Next is Paranoia 2nd Edition. Now, while Paranoia is still going strong, and I recently did an actual play of a video game version, what's out now is a very different game from when I first explored Alpha Complex as a teen. 
Nowadays, the commies are gone completely. You don't mention them. And the system's card-driven D6 based where you need a card of hands to do actions. I don't know. I always had a soft spot for the original D20 system. Uh, to be honest, the first RPG I ever wrote myself stole the system from Paranoia because I was really frustrated because Paranoia told you to ignore the rules. And I'm like, but they're actually really good rules. So I decided to write a game based on them. And I'm, I'm sorry, they're always going to be commie mutant traders come to me, even if I run the new edition. We're, 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 we're not commie friendly here in my household. I'm sorry if that's not politically correct, but my paranoia has got to have commies in it. Of all the editions of paranoia, uh, they're still coming out. I prefer second edition, originally published in 1987. West End Games, that's the one to me that is the most true, the nostalgia. That's what I want to play. Yeah, I know. It's, it's hard to go wrong with it, and it really was part of the joke, where they actually had a really strong system and rules system in place in this game that they told you to ignore uh and yeah. they knew it i mean they were it was it was definitely part of the joke that uh here have this awesome game that we don't want you to play yep because then you'd become exactly uh, and that was paranoia second edition way back in 1987 all right here's one i know sean's gonna agree with completely deanna probably as well and that's warhammer fantasy roleplay first edition from games workshop Later, Hogshead Publishing, but the Games Workshop Edition, Hogshead's the same, same book. I am a huge Warhammer fan. I have been since finding issue 100 of this magazine here, White Dwarf. Uh, that's how I discovered it. Um, then went on to a trip to Toronto, went to my first Games Workshop store, picked up Warhammer Fantasy Battle, the hardcover rulebook. Dove into, oh my god, I love Warhammer Orcs. I've been a Warhammer Orc fan since that book, Warg. I uh, played a ton of Games Workshop games over the years. Still pick up almost anything that has the Games Workshop name on it, but Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is the one that I keep coming back to. Despite the fact that I tell you I love Space Hulk, I can't tell you the last time I played Space Hulk. Warhammer, though, oh, I love those books. Now, I ran a great campaign of Warhammer 3rd Edition. I tried Warhammer 2nd Edition. I was not a big fan of that one. Of all the versions I played, I still have a warm spot in my heart for the original 1st Edition Warhammer, something to do with the black humor in that game that they just never captured in the later editions. Now, there is a fourth edition out there. Uh, I think it's Cubicle 7 puts that out. I haven't had a chance to check that out yet. So, I don't know. I, I just can't see it beating the original for me, but you never know. Maybe it's worth checking out. All right. Huge love for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I mean, it's one of those games where it's it's my D&D &D because it was that fantasy uh, immersion that I got into first, uh, rather than D and D, as as many people did, uh, it's that not it's not low fantasy, but it's lower fantasy. Uh, the magic system was there, but the, they never really printed the magic book, and it it showed up <laughs> eventually out of uh, the ether later. Um, and so it was a grittier sort of uh, thing. And the fact that chaos was encroaching, you weren't going to live long, happy lives. There was no giant palace with millions of retainers and a happy life at the end you were going to die um and so what you were trying to do was really just get in there and make the most of your life while you could uh yep. you you weren't going to uh you know retire on your laurels at the end and, and that had a, a real solid feeling for me yeah hey, that, that's part of what i love about war here too it's all about surviving the day yep. win the battle not the war but I always like that aspect and the, and the small band fighting against impossible odds, right? Being a Star Wars fan, that always <laughs> appealed to me, right? And that's yeah. something I didn't realize until I was older was a big part of Warhammer. It, it's it's very much the evil empire and, and both empires being evil in a way. Uh, plus, I always liked the politics of it. Warhammer was a very political city-based game. It was yeah. very power behind the throne and corruption, which was very different than Delving Dungeon. Literally power behind the throne in one case. Yes, <laughs> yes. But that was uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, first edition. All right, up next, we do have some Dungeons & Dragons. I couldn't put it, not have it on the list. I'm going to frustrate a bunch of OSR people here, probably frustrate some other people. Uh, this is the one I'll probably get the most flack for, because my favorite edition of D&D &D is AD&D second edition, using skills and powers and all that goes with it, the player's option books. Um, I've People who dig older D&D, don't look kindly on second edition much, but this is the game that got me into D&D. &D. 
it wasn't my first D&D experience. My first was, oh, D&D, and it was horrible, which is part of why I didn't come back to it until second edition. But what got me in second edition was the setting material. And yes, I realize it's what kind of killed TSR was the glut of it, but just there was so much out there, and there was so much great stuff, stuff like Dark Sun, Planescape, Al Hadim, and all the amazing worlds with all the artwork, and Braum and Baxa in particular really caught me, like Dark Sun being my favorite. And I loved AD&D for that, and then it just started to shine even more for me and my group near the end of its run. And this was, you could see the roots of third edition in it, and those are those player options books, with the most important, the biggest one that changed the game the most being skills and powers. Now, I know most D&D fans hate these books. They scorn them, but they also didn't like using encumbrance rules and weapon speeds, and I love that stuff too. So I, I personally love skills and powers. I love the options presented and the flexibility of that. It was like having all the little brown books in one, and you could build anything you wanted out of them. And to me, that just that was the icing on the cake for D and D in that time period. Yeah, it was it was a nice move to get rid of the brown books. Uh, as yeah. much as the brown books had some fantastic content in them, the fact that you know to play all the characters you might want to play over here, you had to buy these stack yes. of little brown books that weren't cheap. You know, at the time, um, you know, it was an investment if you wanted to get more than one of them, basically. Uh, and so to be able to do that within skills and power without the uh, without all those little books was fantastic. Well, I mean, I love the brown books, and no, I think no, we had all of them by the end of it. They were good, <laughs> but it was nice to have one book yeah. that let you do all of that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So that was AD and D Second Edition with skills and powers, really to yeah. piss people and off. And I'm sure I hear <laughs> people booing in the distance, but hey. I love fourth edition too, and I get way more flack for that one for some reason. All right, my final RPG goes to a very specific box set, actually. Uh, while I do love the game system and that, but this box set is the Star Wars Introductory Adventure Game. Uh, this was released by West End Games for their Star Wars D6 role-playing system, and, and this was one of the most fun RPG box sets I've ever had the pleasure to run. They did a fantastic job of telling a Star Wars story without having to use any of the main characters or any of the main actual plots. It was very well done. And that rules light version of D6 that just did a great job of capturing that cinematic feel of Star Wars. Now, the West End game Star Wars system also gets credit because that system kept Star Wars going when the movie stopped. A ton of what was written for West End Game Star Wars became official Star Wars canon and became part of the mythology and the lore and spawned books and comics and everything else going. It is literally credited for keeping that license alive between the period of when the movies came out and when George Lucas decided to return to the director's chair, where things kind of went a little pear-shaped, we'll just say. Now, of course, nowadays, most of that history has been scrubbed clean by Disney and thrown out. And I don't even know what they, the, the, I don't know, the old lore expanded, whatever. But you know what? There is some amazing stuff to be found in those books there. Uh, well worth reading. Even if you don't ever plan on playing the RPG, just like picking up those old source books from West End Games. Just fascinating stuff to read. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's so much out there. Uh, it's amazing what uh, what got done and and. You know, it's a, there's a tear in my eye for uh, what has happened since, <laughs> but uh, you can't can't uh, stop the corporate machine sometimes. I just they could have incorporated that stuff. That's what it was. Just the the scrubbing that, that that immediately gave me a bad taste for everything new that came out afterwards. And that was Star Wars from West End Games, but specifically the introductory adventure game. I really recommend, like, if you can find a copy of that, it's, it's not that hard to find. It's not that expensive. Just a really good adventure to throw you into that universe with, like, pre-gen characters and everything. Now, as for games where the older printing is actually better, remember that was the second part of the question. We, we finally got to it. I can think of a couple cases where this is true. Now, this is very much an opinion topic. What we may think may be great old games, as exampled by some of our RPG picks, may not match your ideas, and our thoughts are almost <laughs> certainly colored by our experiences and the rose-colored glasses that those may imply from our youth. Yeah, very true. 
Now, this one, I'll admit, I'm not a fan of. This this one's not for me. So these aren't my rose tinted glasses, but um, local gamer I ran into today, Charles Frank, this is his favorite game. There are a few locals that swear by this, and this is the old Avalon Hill Civilization board game. There's two of them. There's just Civilization, and then later was released Advanced Civilization. Now, these are the games that Sid Meier made Sid Meier's Civilization, right? Like the, the, the video game series everyone knows started from these two Avalon Hill games. These gamers, these local gamers, think that these are the be-all, end-all, beat-out every modern civilization game that's come out since, including the Fantasy Flight Civilization, Through the Ages, which Sean Deanna and I played, Nations, Clash of Cultures. According to them, they're all crap. Play the original Avalon Hill version. Personally, I'm more likely to pop in one of the old computer games, but his fans are rather vocal in their love of that physical series. I've heard Charles uh, opine on it uh, to uh, to no end. Yeah, I'm surprised it didn't come up today while we were at the dentist. Uh, Mega Civilizations is new thing. Now that's modern. That's not old. That someone took the old games and made it play like 12 players or something ridiculous like that. And it takes 13 or so hours to play. And all oh, the people who love it, love it. All right, now here's for one of my own. And this is the original printings of Acquire, the 3M bookcase version of Acquire, published in the 60s and 70s, that included plastic kits, I guess it's probably not the right word, but like upwards stackable, the, the company board was a plastic board with plastic pieces that, that, that slot in. Most of the modern versions of Acquire have replaced those with uh, like cardboard. And it's the original, that it's that tactile nature of the plastic, which really it's an abstract strategy game and it probably shouldn't matter, but there's just something about that feel that I, I, I personally find. And you know what? You can usually find copies of Acquire at things like thrift stores. So in that case, you might even have to go to antique stores. I, the, our copy came from an antique store in Harrow and they, they pop up now and then the older Sid Saxon, Saxon games. Now, here is one I strongly suggest, personal preference here. I know local gamer Roger would disagree, but anyone who has tried the modern Robo Rally, the one that's out now from Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast, I don't know, or Avalon Hill, I don't know which of the three companies they put the logo on, but it looks like a it looks like a Hasbro game. It looks like a kid's game. Uh, if you played this, it's a solid game. It's fun. Go try the original, though. Besides having much better components, including metal miniatures and more cards and thicker boards, uh, the gameplay is actually quite a bit different. For one, you don't each have your own deck. Damage counters actually go on your mecha. Uh, there's all kinds of upgrades. There are a ton of different big box expansions with multiple boards that all have new elements, stuff that you don't find on the new boards. Things like flamethrowers and pushers and plungers and lifts, all stuff that's just not in the modern game. This is a game that I most, and again, another Richard Garfield, going back to, to uh, Magic's Gathering fame, it's, it's one of his earlier games. This is a game I would love to see a modern reprint, but a modern reprint of the original, not the, I don't want to call it crap, but not this new, easily more accessible Robo Rally that's out there now. I still think it has a place. It should be the intro. It should be the intro game, the family edition. Yeah. But I still want my old, almost battle tech level, a little bit more gritty, a little bit more to track a little bit more going on and a little more complex. Yeah, I think we've spoken about this a few times on the show and the new version is great for an introduction to the game. But, you know, you can't beat that feel of the older one even though some people uh are already disagreeing in the chat room. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love the version. Yeah, I have the version with the metal minis. I have the original the original uh was it the coast printing, I think. I have it and all the expansions. I have everything you can buy for the original Robo Rally I own. And those are some games that I sought out and paid good money for that were out of print. The Armed and Dangerous expansion in particular was particularly hard to find. I bought a copy off eBay. That was one. That was one of my favorite games uh, before it got beat out by Power Grid. And then later Wallenstein. Both which came out after 2000. All right. When we get into RPGs, right? For older games that are better than new games. There are a lot of people out there that are going to mention their favorite game that they grew up with. There are a lot of older gamers who shun modern games completely. Uh, remember number uh, 74 from a few episodes back? There's one of them. Uh, some of these people love and play the classic games to this day and still play them. Uh, along with this, there's the whole OSR thing. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but it generally stands for old school renaissance, though people have other versions. 
And this is modern gamers, modern games, modern designers creating and playing games that have that old school feel. Uh, these are games like Dungeon Crawl Classics that I've been talking about recently, and games like Zweehander. Zweehander is a modern update to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. Um, what's great about RPGs, though, and this is the thing that really shines when it comes to this particular topic, is almost all of these games are still available. You're going to be able to find a PDF of almost everything, and please find a legal PDF and pay for it. You are going to be able to find them. Plus, you can still get print editions for a lot of these. If you go to Drive Through RPG, you can print the AD and D, uh, no, sorry, the Dungeons and Dragons Rules Compendium, which is considered by the old school gamers to be the gold standard of classic D and D. The whole BECM, Beck Me, whatever you want to call it, all in one book. You can get a modern version printed for about twenty bucks. It's amazing. Like almost all of these old RPGs, you can get printed. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, despite the fact Games Workshop wouldn't do it, as soon as Critical. Uh, Cubicle 7 got the license, they released all the books in PDF. If you want to try out Warhammer Fantasy First Edition, you can. Yeah. Now, one thing about the older RPGs, even more so than games, is that the content within them may be problematic in some ways that people now find offensive. Pronouns, yeah. sexism, racism were a part of these games, and many modern editions have, for the most part, <laughs> you know, not completely, but have come a long way in trying to fix some of those problematic issues that existed in older versions. You will find, you know, the he pronoun used excessively or yeah. the she pronoun used universally for everything or all the different things depending on, you know, when it was released um, and, and some of the, the racist origins of races mm -hmm. in fantasy games exist. Now, your sensitivity to that may vary um if you can deal with some of that again some of these systems are still really good game systems they just have some writing that in the modern day problematic no very true very true very fair and some of the modern versions of these games have not done enough to correct that problem i will i will i will wink at dcc there we were groaning a bit while going through the character generation rules because a DC-10 check, which is your standard check in that game, is a man's deed, mm. as an example. And that's that's not the most to reach us. All right, that's it for tonight from Sean and I. We'll go to the lobby in a minute to see how that's going, see if they've got anything. But if you've got a question for us, something like this, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, we're heading over to the lobby to see what they think. I didn't see a lot going by, but what classic games did we miss? Was there anything on there? I know I know we must have made Ryan happy talking about Battletech. I wasn't even thinking about the fact that he's such a huge Battletech fan. If Ryan's not talking to me about coffee, he's talking to me about Battletech. Uh, I saw Deluxe Illuminati. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Getting mentioned That's the old Steve Jackson game. Yep, yep. Uh, and uh, they pointed out that Jordan Weissman founded WizKids, which is probably why you recognize Oh, that's why I know the name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I know that name. I know I know that name. Yep. Uh, every once in a while, we saw some deals in there that people missed out on getting Starfarers of Catan for 30 bucks. Oh, at, uh, at a con. Yeah, that's a good one. One of the reasons I don't play mine, I'm missing one chip, and I should do something to replace it. But it's one of the reasons my copy doesn't come out. So it's one of the starting world chits, and it's like, oh, I'm missing a chit. So just I have a note for myself here. So from 2000 to 2005, uh, this is I almost didn't shouldn't have went this far back really when talking about great games that you don't want to miss. And I wanted to include this in here because it's important is 2000 to 2005 is when the Euro game renaissance happened, right? It's when Catan caught on, when it got popular, when it started showing up in Games Magazine, and when people started to take notice, right? This is when Mayfair Games and Rio Grande started bringing over all the German game designer games, right? Those five years are insane when I look through Board Game Geek. Like the entire Aaliyah series came out that time. The Aaliyah Big Box and the Small Box. Almost all the games I consider classic and still play are from that time period. And I'm like, we could do a whole other episode on slightly newer, but not quite as old games that are hard to find. Like some of my favorite games of all time, including Wallenstein, Power Grid, 
Princes of Florence, Traders of Genoa, uh, Starship Catan, which is a two-player version that they so need to reprint. That was actually our favorite Catan. Deanna and I would play Starship Catan over and over and over again. And it was this two-player only version of Catan that was so good. So many games came out in that window. And I didn't realize it until I was like halfway through doing this post, right? So I'm doing this post and I'm like, I keep thinking of games. I'm like, oh, that, oh, Puerto Rico. Like, come on, that's considered like up to, beside Catan, one of the most well-known. Known. Uh, San Juan, the inspiration for Race for the Galaxy. They all came out in that window. It's a, it's a crazy time period with so many great games. Yep. Uh, Ancient Games is saying we could redo this topic just the 2000 and 2005 edition. <laughs> and yeah. I'm interested to see what's yet out of print. What would actually be almost interesting is to do a uh, a Vassal's Law edition where we look and see what games actually haven't yet come back around. What, what, yeah, what, you know, what is out of print that, that needs to be uh, you know caught up in, in Vassal's Law? That's a good one. Someone send that as an official question. We'll throw it on the list. Uh, so I noticed why I noted that Descent first edition being better than second edition. I know lots of people would disagree with them. That's a fantasy flight game. I can't talk to it. I have first edition. I liked first edition, but it was a pain to set up. It was fiddly as heck, and it took like four hours sometimes to play games. And it was really hard as me to play the keeper, the dungeon master, without being a dungeon master. Because I have a real hard time playing that role without advocating for the players. Because I want to tell a good story and I want them to succeed, which is something that takes people years to learn as a dungeon master sometimes. But in that game, you're supposed to be the enemy. You're supposed to be adversarial because it's a board game. Whereas second edition, uh, for one, made it quicker so you can play in less than an hour, made the adventures more balanced, made the uh, role of the keeper a little more random, so it's a little less in your face. But even more than that, they eventually put out an app that turns it into a pure co-op. And those are the reasons I would lean towards second. And I own second. It's in the pile of shame. But that's a big game to get into. Like, it's like it's like starting up another. Like, you don't have to play with the same players every time. But you kind of want to go through the campaign with the same people. And when I'm already playing Gloomhaven, there's not a lot of chance I'm going to get to sent to e to the table anytime. Yep, absolutely. The app, the app, the app. I think was the the the, the major game changing. Uh, yeah, that's aspect. the biggest one. Big killer app, killer app, as it were. <laughs> Weird morning started. Wants to play more than two games of Descent in a row. See, that's just it. I, I haven't even played two, but like you can play two, unlike Descent First Edition. So, in defense of one e, I should have mentioned when playing one of the campaign. Yeah, the campaign stories maybe better. That's possible. What's that? What was the talk about patching? I missed that. Oh, uh, D, uh, D was was saying that you can just play an old school RPG, uh, like an actual old school RPG. That, but by playing the old school RPG, not you know patching the game and and with the modern with version. Of it. The modern versions do tend to fix it. What I've noticed, especially with the OSR games, is that there were different camps that didn't like certain parts of AD and D or D and D or whatever version, and they each made their own version. So if you want to go rules light, not worry about encumbrance or whatever, there's this game. I don't couldn't tell you which is which. But if you really like the tracking everything in the simulation where you want to track torches and this and this and this, there's that game. And then if you really like the the weird settings, there's this game. And there seemed to be like that breakout where everyone's made their own fix for D&D. So whatever flavor. So if you could figure out which house rules you used to use, you could probably find a modern version that does that probably a little better than the original. Uh, what people do like to point out is that AD&D as written is unplayable which I've never actually read them. I have the books, but they were my dad's. But like people talk about High Gygaxian and how literally if you tried to follow the rules as written, they contradict in so many spots, it's impossible. So a lot of the newer ones cleaned up Gygax's prose right. and turned it into actual rules. And I realized that the biggest push on OSR, and this is the thing that the modern games are trying to recapture, which I do agree with, is the concept of rulings over rules. And it's the fact that there are no rules that for most of the stuff you're going to do the DM is given a set of tools to create rulings on the fly. And that is the biggest change, and that's a pushback against D&D 3.5 and 3.0, where it was the opposite, where it was Monty Cook days, and they were trying to make the game more of a competition, and they're trying to make it more organized play, where everyone would have the exact same experience at the table, no matter who they play it under. Which I think is also a very valid way to play, and something that, that makes sense to strive for. But the two, those two types of play are very much at heads with each other. And that's where you get the main two camps in role-playing. 
Then on the other hand, you have the people on the forge making modern story games going, why do we need game masters? And everyone should tell the story at once and doing their own thing, which has spawned into the apocalypse worlds and everything else of today. Yeah, no, it's a uh, RP. We can, I mean, well, there are entire podcasts dedicated to this yes. sort of thing on RPGs. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I we I we talk about RPGs. I have no problem talking about RPGs, but I think there are other shows that do a better job deep diving stuff. Like Absolutely, this. not it's it's we know it, but it's it's again you need to spend so much time going into the minutia of yeah. the the various camps and things that uh, it's it's tough. Uh, well. I think that's about it for the lobby for now. We'll uh, we, we might see, pop in later and see what's happening. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We keep growing the brand more and more with things happening all the time. Time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your email inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released the week previous. Blog posts, podcast episodes, unboxings, actual plays, everything we create gets listed there. A nice one, nice clickable list. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, for this week's Patreon update, we're going to continue taking a look at our revised Patreon and another tier. This week, we are looking at the hotel guest level. All right, this level to me, when Deanna and I designed our new Patreon and sat down, this is the one that we consider the sweet spot, right? This is uh, the one that gives you the most bang for your buck and what we expect to be our most popular backer level. The first perk you get for being a hotel guest is that any questions you send us get bumped to the top of our question list. The next perk is access to our bonus audio. Now, every time Sean and I sit down to record our podcast, like we're doing right now, we start off each show with a guest check-in, or not guest check, just check-in segment, where we kill some time. We interact with our chat room, we wait for notifications to go out to the web, and for people to show up, because no one joins a stream the second it goes live. So we kill some time there. Then about halfway through the show, we have a coffee break segment where we literally refill our coffee cups, usually do a review of the coffee we're drinking, and talk about what's going on, and sometimes interact with the lobby a bit more. Then finally, at the end of the show, we have what we've always called our penthouse suite after show, sticking with the hotel thing. Now here things can get explicit, and we talk about pretty much everything and anything. Hotel guests get access to the audio from all three of these segments, as well as any outtakes that I have to cut out from the show for the final podcast. Now, up next, patrons at the hotel guest level do get access to patron-only polls over on our Patreon. Now, that's actually how we decide what we talked about tonight. I probably wouldn't have picked this episode. I gave our patrons a choice of four different topics, and they went with this one. Last week, we talked about the Tabletop Gaming Deals Hot Deals newsletter. Hotel guests also get the option to opt in to receive hot gaming deals in their inbox. No, this is an opt-in. We're not going to give it to you unless you ask. Hotel guests also get all of the Tip the Bellhop patron rewards that we covered two weeks ago, which is access to our Discord channel, behind-the-scenes blog posts, and our pre-production show notes. And finally, all get hotel guests will get five bonus entries to any contests or giveaways we hold. Which leads us to our medium giveaway. It's official. The review went live on the blog earlier today. And with it, our online giveaway has launched. You just have to head over to tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, you can click on reviews, but it's probably going to be the top post anyway. Find my medium review, scroll down, and enter through the widget at the bottom of the page. We are giving away two copies of Medium, the mind-reading card game from Greater Than Games. The contest will run for three weeks, and we'll be announcing our winner on our live show March 11th. This contest will be open to anyone in Canada and the U.S. We do apologize, international listeners, but the cost of shipping a $20 game, it just doesn't make sense. All right, Breakout Con, hitting March 20th, 22nd. It's at the Sheridan Center in downtown Toronto, Ontario. The entire Belltop team is going to be there. 
Join us at one of this country's fastest growing tabletop gaming conventions, featuring a massive board game library, an amazing selection of popular and independent role playing game sessions, diverse panels, and one of the most impressive guest lists you'll ever see. It really is true. They keep adding more. It's insane. I don't know where they're going to put them all. I, I really don't. I don't, I don't think there's going to be actually people who pay to go to this con. Everyone's guests are where there is media. Uh, you can find out more at Breakout con all one word dot com all right when's the last time you headed over to tabletopbellhop.com did you notice anything new there's ads on there we partnered with mediavine and over the last few weeks we've been working with them to get the blog ready to start serving ads all that work paid off and at about 7 p.m yesterday right sorry uh, 7 oh. p.m eastern today those yep. ads went live yeah, it was just this afternoon. Like, we had to throw this in last minute to the show. Now, I got to say, I do. I hate this. I, I hate the fact that we had to take this step. But serving ads on the site may just be the thing that lets me keep doing this whole bellhop jig. Well, we do greatly appreciate our Patreon patrons and people who take the time to send tips or buy us a coffee and sponsors like Quiver Time, which we've had in the past. It's just not enough to pay the bills. So... As well as uh, having these ads, we would like to reach out to people who do visit the tabletopbellhop.com blog. And for those of you, like myself, who run ad blockers, if you could whitelist tabletopbellhop.com so that the ads do pop up, we're going to try and do our best to make sure they aren't offensive. Yeah. But if uh, the, the more people who block them, the more ads we need to show to the people who do, do, who do get to see them. Yeah, that would be awesome. That's going a step above, but we would appreciate it if you do whitelist too. Now, we went with a company called Mediavine. Now, the reason we went with them, they are the best at actually matching content creators like us with niche advertisers that match our content and brand. Now, right now, we just went live, and what their people are doing right now is trying to shop our site out. They're trying to show it to companies, and then companies will buy specific ad spots on our site. So as they're found, the ads you see on the site should get better focused, more on track. Now, this is going to take some time, but I'm already seeing stuff on there like Right Stuff Anime and Gundam series. So I got to say that's better than the car commercials and banking info I seem to see when I go on, like, say, recipe sites. One of the first ads I saw on there when I went and checked it out today was for D&D. &D. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're getting but, there. There's a, there. There are some ads that aren't on brand, and that's, no, definitely that's, not. that's absolutely going to happen for a while. But hopefully, the longer we, the longer this goes on, the closer and more realistic these uh, ads will get. And it is like most of these ad networks. What will happen is if they can't sell an ad spot, it'll get replaced by a generic Google AdSense ad. So you're probably going to see some of those that happens. Even if you go to Board Game Geek, you see that. That's just part of doing ads. Now, as always, we would love your feedback. Um, I don't want to drive people away. I really don't. Uh, we had a very. I like the way our site liked. I don't like the way it looks with ads. But you know what? It's the internet. Like everyone's pretty much used to seeing ads omnipresent pretty much everywhere you go. It's one of those I started going to some of the big name name media sites and going to places and like, oh yeah, they've got ads. Oh, they've got ads. Like I, I think by now most people are so used to seeing them, they hopefully won't even notice them because it's just part of every other website. Now it's on ours too. Now, if they really do bother you, I would like to know. Uh, I just hope people are willing to accept them as a necessary evil. Up next, our review of Medium, the mind-reading card game from Greater Than Games. All right, first off, I need to note that I was given a review copy of Medium by Greater Than Games, and they were also awesome enough to give me three extra copies to give away to you fine folk. One, we're giving away locally here in Windsor, and two more we're currently running a contest for on our webpage. If it's before March 11th, 2020, when you're hearing this, head over to tabletopbellhop.com to enter. All right, Medium was designed by Danielle Dealey, Lindsay Sherwood, Nathan Thornton. It features art from Sarah Kelly, was produced in 2019 by Greater Than Games, and there's another company I forgot to put in here. It's on the back. Let me find it. Storm Chaser Games. I had Mo for not fixing that in the notes. I fixed it on the blog post and I missed it because Storm Chaser retweeted my review and I'm like, who's Storm Chaser? And I'm like, oh, they made the game. I missed that. And uh, Board Game Geek didn't have them listed. Like, they're listed, but they're under the more section. So, yes, 
comes up, Storm Chaser, this is their first game. Greater than games have put out many games, many great games. They're the publisher, Storm Chaser made it. Anyway, uh, this is a party game that plays two to eight players, either separately or on teams. Games last about half an hour, depending on the number of players. If you want to see what comes in a copy of Medium, head over to YouTube and check out our unboxing video. For those of you who haven't had a chance to watch that yet, what comes in the box? All right, on top of everything, once you list the cover, you'll find the rule book, full color, 10-page book, glossy pages. Uh, main rules are only six pages long. And then there's plenty of variants and in the back of the book, and there's lots of examples, pictures of the cards, components. Uh, solid rule book, nothing to complain about that there. Under that are a bunch of punch boards. All of these just have scoring tiles. Uh, interestingly, these are also glossy. This is a recurring theme. They're all, like, coated in a thin plastic film. They were well cut, but I did have one chit that like took some of that film with it on another piece, so I had to cut that off afterwards. But like they're they're definitely coated with something shiny. Uh, under this is a pack of sixteen cards. These are your ESP special power cards. Under those are a bunch of dividers, and under that is one plastic baggie, which is cool because it's something to hold the score tokens. And I am always impressed and pleased when companies include baggies in their games. And thankfully, it's becoming more of the norm than the exception these days. Yeah, I totally agree. It is great to see. Boxes and turrets and baggies. And I think part of it are companies going, man, other people are selling this stuff and making money on it. We should be doing it ourselves. And I totally agree. Under that, you have four rather thick packs of cards. Uh, these contain the word cards from the games, and they're split into 15 different sets. Now, the cards are kind of unique because they stick to that whole glossy thing, which is a bit of a problem because it makes them rather slippery. Now, this is great when shuffling. It really is. They shuffle really nice. But you got to actually be a little careful when stacking the deck. We've had a few slide. Now, other than the gloss, the cards are decent. Uh, they're not the thickest. They're not quite playing card thickness. And they're a little sparse. I personally couldn't help but think the words could have been bigger. Like, it looks like they picked the font to fit the biggest word. But they could have just, like, put them diagonally or even more, make the cards landscape. And then you could have made them the width of the whole card. Uh, not a huge problem, but just something that just... It seems like for a word game where the important thing is how the reading the word, they could have done better. Yeah, indeed. For whatever design reason, they've gone with the words taking up a vanishingly small portion of the actual card. Now, I don't doubt that they tried other variations in the design, but the final choice does seem to be an oddly small print, a lot of wasted negative space that essentially costs money to you know, make a game with a lot of dead space. I guess maybe it doesn't cost uh, anything to print in white because the cards are already right white. I don't know. Uh, under everything else is what ends up being a rather serviceable cardboard insert that does a really good job of keeping everything safe. Um, in our unboxing video, like I shook the heck out of this thing and nothing moved. Um, it's also worth noting that the box is designed to hold sleeve cards for those of you who prefer to play with protection. Now, the insert was rather subtle, and I think you nearly missed that they'd even yeah. had an insert the very first time you opened it up, or at least how it was going to work. <laughs> yeah. And then those dividers are just oh, yeah. the right size. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is one that I, I now know there is an expansion out. It's not going to fit in this box. Now, the expansion box looks like it might be a little bigger, so I'm thinking both might fit in the expansion box. But yeah, the dividers, it's it's a tight fit. Uh, they actually have to lean just slightly, but they do. The, like I said, you, the divider, which I did, I almost missed it. It's like a flap that's flattened down. You actually have to kind of pull up to, to finish the insert. All right, well, so how does one play medium? All right, you pick out a number of sets of cards, one of their 15 each, equal to the number of players minus one, shuffle them together, then you put these broken crystal ball cards in the bottom third of the deck. Those determine when the game ends. Give each player a hand to six cards. Now, these cards are single words. Pizza, Halloween, pirate, morgue, spot, potato, hotel, astronaut, etc. Um, just think of what's in common on all those words, and that you can start to get what this game's about. Uh, starting with the player to the left of the starting player, they're going to look at their hand and put a card in front of them and say the word on the card. Then the starting player is going to look at that card, look at their hand, and play a card from their hand and say the word on that card. Then it's up to the characters to make a psychic bond, stare at each other in the eyes, and both simultaneously, after counting down three, two, one, say the medium, the word that connects the two words on the table. Three, two, one, say it. Now, if they both said the same thing, they made the connection, they take one of the scoring tokens, so it's got a one on the back. Now, if players fail to make a connection, they get another try, 
But this time, they have to use the words they just said, not the words on their card. And they can't use any words that are already in play. Now, if players succeed on a second try, they take a number two scoring chip. If they fail on the second round, they get one more chance. And again, using the two words they just said, but not using any of the words, either the cards or stuff that's already been said. And a match on this one, they take a three. Otherwise, it passes to the next player. Actually, either way, it passes to the next player. Players then draw replacement cards, and the game continues to go around the table until those three cracked crystal ball cards are drawn. Once the third card's drawn, you finish the round and flip over everyone's scoring tokens, which are slightly randomized, like a, a three token, I think, is a four, five, or six. Or sorry, a one token's a four, five, or six, whereas a three token's a one, two, or three. Add up your points, and it's the pair with the most points that wins. Yeah, it's an interesting game, and some of the text on the box uh, seems odd to me. Uh, like, they, they talk about finding the medium word between two yep. cards, and to me... That is a, a medium. A medium is 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 something very specific. It's sort of a you know an almost mathematical definition, whereas the concept of a medium being is you know the psychic idea of a medium connecting with another player in that you know mystical manner it makes a lot of sense. Finding the medium word between two words to me is nonsensical. It doesn't actually mean anything. Um, but it's the you know it's it's what they've gone with on their theme. And uh, so that's what yeah, that is. That, that's their pun, yeah. right? That's what they call it, is you're trying to find the medium. You're trying to find the word that's in common with both the words. You're trying to find a word, word or set, set of words. And one thing that uh, should be noted is that within each of the 15 sets of cards, the words within that deck are not related. No. Uh, basically, what they did is they built 15 word lists and then separated them so you get sort of, you know, one in each across so between two decks there will be some words that are in common but within the deck there isn't really any obvious connection no. between them um so uh quick to set up quick to play and about as easy to score as you can get you flip your card your yeah. token over add up the numbers you got and you're done yeah very simple and scoring that actually kind of works which is surprising there's a lot of party games out there where you just toss the scoring out the window i could still see doing this but you know what it works now, the first time I played Medium, it was with the Bellhop team, Sean, Deanna, and I, and I think everyone listening probably realizes we're not really the target market for this game. None of us are really party gamers. Uh, but by turn two of our game of Medium, the three of us were laughing. Like, not just laughing, ha, 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 no, but laughing that full body shaking, can't catch your breath, trying not to fall out of your chair style of laughing. And it was then that I realized that this game is a hit. Indeed. This game works in a large part because of what the players themselves bring to the table, even more than what the game does. The game is a tool to help the players express themselves and often in hilarious ways due to how the decks are built. So since that first game, I've now played medium with other groups of gamers at other player counts. I got to say so far, it seems like it definitely plays better with more than three. But then once you get past four into five, there is some downtime because only two players at once play. So with five players, you got three people sitting there not playing. Now, it should be entertaining enough to watch the people who are playing. Plus, if you're playing medium in a social situation, right, where people are having drinks and talking anyway, this is probably fine. Those other three people talk amongst themselves and socialize. But if you're going to break this out, like on game night, where everyone's sitting at the game table ready to focus on playing, some of those gamers may get frustrated by this downtime. So the game really relies on, uh, sorry, well, I don't think any of us have played it at two players yet. No, um, not yet. Haven't you had can a chance. Clearly, you can clearly see how its amusement would start to tarnish pretty quickly. Um, but in a pinch, it could be a quick way to, you know, spend a, kill a couple of minutes, uh, a few minutes. I, I probably should try it two player, but it doesn't interest me. It's a party game. So yeah. there, I have, there I have lots of two player games or two player games meant to be played with two players. Party games aren't two player games to me. I, I'm not saying that it doesn't work at two. Maybe it does. I've heard people who've had fun with it at two. Now, every group I have tried it with has enjoyed it. Uh, I've yet to have anyone hate the game, uh, even people who I thought were going to hate the game or thought themselves they were going to hate it. As we said, the games are really simple to teach. Um, usually after about three pairs, like three sets of people going, the game kind of clicks. Like there's definitely a level of oh, okay, here's a better way to come up with words that make easier connections. Like there is a bit of a trick to play medium, uh, which is very dependent on which players you're playing with. 
I, what I did find is that each successive play, it's easier to come up with the, the medium a little better. Uh, one of the secrets is to kind of zoom out. Like, don't don't say uh, Gandalf, say wizard, as an example. And once everyone starts to get that, the game seems to flow a little better. Yeah, the game really relies on the shared connection you might have with your partner, be it shared experiences, uh, educational background, or just life experiences. Yeah. Uh, it also should be noted that this game can get blue. So a session zero of some sort before playing, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, can go a long way to avoid any awkwardness that might pop up if, you know, you got a couple of uh, strange cards come up. Yeah, this is the same way that, like, uh, almost any party game can go there, right? Apples to apples. This is not exclusive game. This is not a for-adult game, but it can go there with certain card combinations. Now, I mentioned this already. I was surprised the scoring system here works. Um, though, despite that, you might want to toss it out and just play it as an experience instead of a game. And then Deanna noted uh, one of the things is the crystal balls. She'd be more tempted to throw those out just because the game does sometimes seem to be a little short. Whereas without them, you can just keep playing until you're sick of playing. Overall, I am having a lot of fun showing off this game and playing this game, um, despite being pretty bad personally at making connections, it seems. Uh, the rare one does happen. But you know what? I'm having fun even when it fails, just to see the words that people are coming up with. And I yet have I have yet to experience that boredom because I've always been very interested in what the other players are coming up with. If you're into party games at all, just pick this up. Like, it's almost a no-brainer. This should be on your shelf along with code names and the mind in the game. If you dig word games, I also suggest this, because this is one of those, if you're into this categories and the, the oh, what's the silly one where you make up definitions of words? Like, if you're into those, those type of word guessing games, again, uh, probably worth picking it up. But if you're like me and not a big party gamer, I'd suggest checking it out. Like, find out if anyone's doing a demo. If you're in Windsor, I'm doing one this weekend on Saturday. But come out, try to see if you can try the game out. This is the kind of game that once you experience it, you'll know after the first play if it's for you or not. Yeah, so one thing we discovered is you do need to be focused for this game. Well, you can yeah. take time before, the count, before you do your shared countdown to think. Some people got flustered and would say something other than what was intended in a moment of panic once you hit that, you know, once you said yeah. one. but that adds to the hilarity, if not your score. Yeah, it's definitely one, like I said, there's a knack to it, right? And there's a, a level of social comfort that is required to play well. It might take a couple plays for you to loosen up. Uh, Deanna, in particular, had a little difficulty grasping the game at first. Not grasping it, she got the game. But it's that, it's that social, the anxiety, the timing element, the, the mind blank. And when we played at easy mode on the weekend, she at first backed out, didn't want to play at all. She's just like, no, no, I don't want. And then we started playing with four people. And then she jumped in because she saw other players having the same problem. She's like, all right, it's not just me. So it just took that bit to get going. For a more in-depth look at Medium and a chance to win your own copy of this game, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here what games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Speaking of cool gaming stuff that's going on, last Friday, we thought we reached this major branching point in Gloomhaven, and we made a big deal about it. We tried to get everyone we could out to our live stream, and we had the chat decide which way we could go, only to find out that there was one more step to complete what we were doing. Uh, totally no spoilers. Don't worry, you don't have to turn us off. Well, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen next. We're going to take a sidetrack because Deanna finally has a chance to retire her mind thief. She has been playing the first same character, the first starting six since our first game together over two years ago and has been stuck at level nine for I don't know how long, not even bothering to track experience. So we fear it's only fair that we're going to do this side quest, which will let her retire next. I just hope it goes better than her solo missions did. Now, for those of you who don't catch the show, it really is pretty momentous, as the rest of the party has felt like a revolving door, while the ever-present mind thief held it together through thick and thin. All right, Saturday, I already kind of mentioned this in our medium review. We had an event at Easy Mode, one of our bits and boards events. 
I did also happen to be Valentine's Day weekend, and I think this was a bad mix because, man, we had our worst showing ever. Uh, props to the people who did show up. We did have some time. We did play some games, but it was a one-table night that night. Sadly, some people would rather not game with their significant others, but what could be more of an expression of love than sharing in games? I don't get it. And who goes out to eat on Valentine's? Like, you want to wait in line and need reservations, and I don't get it. I'd rather go out with Deanna for dinner on any other night of the week. All right, so up first, we started off with a four-player game of Gold West. This is from Tasty Minstrel Games. Uh, While Deanna and I had a good time, uh, Roger also played it, seemed to dig it. Our fourth player, Scott, was not a fan of this game. Well, he noted it was a neat game, and he kind of said, like, it didn't seem to be broken. He literally said, I don't ever have to play that again. So... You don't get a more crushing review than that, really. Uh, so this is the first major strike against Gold West, though he did know that he liked the Moncala mechanic for, for starting your turn and determining what you get to do. So the first time I played Gold West was at Extra Life, but honestly, I'd almost forgotten I'd played it. Uh, <laughs> even looking at it on BGG to take a look at the board, I could barely recall playing <laughs> it. It wasn't bad, but it very clearly doesn't stick out as remarkable for me. Very, very fair. I've been having fun with it. Like when we played, actually, like the Deanna and I and Roger were like, "Oh, that was a good game." And Scott was like, "Oh," but then Deanna noted, like, "I felt bad. Like I didn't get the, I didn't catch the vibe from him that he wasn't enjoying it while we were playing." So I felt kind of bad that we finished it, but I, I still dig it. I find it, it's a neat, quick game. There's some cool mechanics there. It's definitely like, uh, no, nah, I don't want to compare two games and shoot something else down. But I, I'm digging it. But obviously, it's not for everyone. Yeah, to me, I mean, again, it was it was a perfectly fine game. But, in, you know, in this day and age, perfectly yeah. fine games don't really cut it that well. So we, we seem to have opposite opinions of another game there. Or I have that same feeling as you do. But again, yeah. I don't need to bash that game here. Uh, up next was a five player game of Raiders of the North Sea. Again, exploring the Hall of Heroes expansion. Now, it's my second time using Call of Heroes. And the players playing were a mix of new and experienced players. And this time I really saw the tossing in Hall of, Hall of Heroes right away. Is probably a bit much for someone who doesn't know the base game. Now, it's not that Hall of Heroes is difficult to learn or mechanically complicated. Like, it all just works, but it's that branching path, the number of options that are added. And this is the part key. It's options that are hard to value the importance of if you haven't played the game. So, yeah, now you can go to the Mead Hall. Well, if you haven't played before, how do you know if you should go to the Mead Hall or not? And that, I wouldn't say was a problem, but it was definitely a thing that I know is teaching the game. Now, as for the experienced players, they all loved it. Um, everyone loved the heroes. Everyone loved the new stuff. Everyone seemed to dig it. But for the players who hadn't played before, I felt bad for introducing that expansion right away because they just basically kind of fumbled around. Yeah, it's another one I need to add to the game pile of games I need to try eventually. Yeah. I have a sneaky suspicion that it's going to be one of those games that, wow, that's a great game, but that's way too super Euro I for me. But I don't know. Possibly. Again, I haven't I haven't played it yet. I I'm just I'm just going off of of the uh, you know the reviews I've heard you talk about so far. It's way lighter than say Orleans or Pulsar, so okay. so a lot less again options right compared to the options in Pulsar. Right. At the start of the game, you only have three different places you can go where you can raid. But Whereas then you I still want to play Orleans, and now you so. have five. Right. All right. We finished off with a five-player game of medium. I already basically talked about this. This went over really well. Um, I actually mentioned this in the review section, but the amusing part here was the fact Deanna was like, oh, hell no, I don't want to play this. But then we started playing, and after seeing a couple other players stumble with the same problem she's had where, you know, the words just don't come out, she's like, ah, fine, if it's not just me, I'm not going to feel embarrassed. If it's happening to other people, I'll join in. And we played a full five-player game, so that was cool. Uh, I got to say, if you can convince a heavy Euro fan like Deanna to jump into a party game, they must have done something right with medium. Yeah. So with, with all party games, the right mix of people is really what's required. Yeah. Uh, up next comes Sunday night. Uh, this was our first monthly game night with a patron. Uh, Deanna, Sean, and I met up with Evil John Carney over the virtual tabletop and played some Terra Mystica through Board Game Arena. Uh, this started off with me trying to teach through Board Game Arena, which I felt went pretty rough. So I have to say, John seemed to pick it up well enough. So I must have done a halfway decent job on teaching that game. Um, I had a ton of fun playing it. Like, that was just fun playing it. John's a good guy. 
uh, chatting with John about this and that while we played and talking about cons. And I got to say, it was a great success. I, I was really impressed by it. John seemed pretty happy, which I guess is the most important part. Uh, you played in that game. What'd you think? Well, aside from my abysmal showing at the game, I think it was definitely a fun experience for all of us. Uh, and I look forward to playing with patrons more regularly for those that are able to support at that backer level. It's uh, always great to find new people to play games with. So, yeah, Sean learned the secret of don't terraform from two levels on the first turn. Yeah, in no, that just case, because, I just because you're to able to do safe. something in the game, you know, just, beca just because you have that ability to do a, mo a move in the game, yeah. Not mean you should do it. Yeah, that was Sean's first time playing on Board Game Arena. We had played the game in person once before, so you were pretty new right. to it, too. Well, and I mean, I, in, in hindsight, I knew that that was a dumb move to do, except yeah. I was trusting PGA over, overly. Yeah, you were like, like hey, I can do this. Here. No, I shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, last... round, round one, it was pretty much over for me after, yeah, you, after you, that you, mistake. It was a bad mistake. You, you, it, was, it was a rough one. That was a game like I tried to push Sean to restart because he also didn't know, and I was more doing it for your sake than his. Ah, I'm I like, let's that. give Sean a chance. But you know what? We had fun. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty awesome, actually. And thanks, John, for joining us and backing. Uh, last game of the week was on Monday. Uh, now I should be sitting here talking about a fabulous DCC funnel and how many characters have died. But unfortunately, the game had to be canceled due to every single player but Deanna having something come up last minute. It happens. We got a whole episode about that. We try for next week. Now, sticking to my own advice that we gave in that episode, where I talked about trying to keep the schedule, try to stick to still gaming when people cancel, just so it becomes habit, it becomes part of the, you do it, you're gaming Monday night. To do that, so I asked Deanna if she'd be willing to try to learn a game from my pile of shame, uh, one of my uh, gifts I bought at Christmas, from the gift certificate, Clans of Caledonia. She agreed and we set up a, a quick, as a relative term, a quick two-player game. Now, despite a rough start, it was uh, relatively rough. Uh, this is up there with, with um, Terra Mystica and the fact that you have eight different available actions every turn, and there's a lot of similar concepts as Terra Mystica, the way adjacency works, and there's actually a shipping track that's fairly similar. But then the game's also very different in another way. Uh, with uh, asymmetric powers, you have different clans of different Scottish clans, and all of them break the rules in different ways. Like it, it was, it was a little rough. It went pretty well once we got it. Uh, both of us though felt this was a learning game. Like we basically fumbled um, around and did stuff because it kind of made sense. And this is one of those games. As soon as we finished, it was like, oh, now I get it. Now I want to play for real. Uh, unfortunately, it was one a.m., so that was out of the question. Now, this is only one play, but man, I am impressed, like really impressed. This was good. This was really good. I, I have to thank my Twitter feed in general for suggesting I pick up this game for quite some time now. Finally going out and purchasing it, it, it was well worth the price I paid. I, I paid full price. No, it was a uh, Boxing Day, so I got a slight discount, but I bought this at the local game store. Um, this was a tight, solid Euro economic game with some really neat stuff. Now, I do have to totally disagree with anyone who says this kills Ter Terra Mystica or Gaia Project, like, yeah, they're somewhat similar, but they're not at all like once you're actually playing them. Like, I realize I, they don't even have designers in common, so I don't even quite know. Like, th th there's a couple mechanics, but I don't know. Well, I did really enjoy this, this does not in any way make me reconsider uh, my joy of playing Terra Mystica or that I'll never want to play it again. The one does not replace the other in any way. All right. And, uh, well, I got, uh, Minecraft to the table again. The, uh, the kids, you know, were, were asking for it. So we got it out again. Uh, my son's still struggling a little bit with the, with the scoring. Uh, but man, my daughter is on it. I beat her by uh -huh. one point and I did not think I was going to beat her. Um, nice. it just, I just edged her out and I, it was just one of those scoring things because I thought she had it. Um, she has got it, got, got it figured out. She knows how to use the bonuses. Um, and, uh, and actually I think we even figured out something that we'd done extreme the first game that kept our scores down from yeah. what they could have been that first game. Um, uh, so yeah, no, it's, uh, the kids are still loving it. That's great to see. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? Go the park. Yeah. <laughs> how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. We've mentioned already for those of you in the chat room, come out to CG realm. 10 o'clock, everyone listening. 
anyone who's local, anyone who can, no one's going to catch us till Tuesday, right? None of this comes out on the weekend. But yeah, uh, come play medium. Someone who tries it out this Saturday is going to bring home this copy, this one right here. It's yours. You get to take it home. Just got to play a game. Well, anyone uh, who even occasionally finds a reason to see a party game played should absolutely check this out. Remember, even our hardcore Euro lover had fun with it. Yeah, it's true. Uh, the week after that, we're doing a party here. We're having a gaming leap year party on the 29th, something that maybe will become a every four-year tradition here. We'll see. Uh, this is kind of to replace our annual New Year's party and my usual gaming birthday bash canceled due to me being ill pretty much all of January. I'm really looking forward to having some people over playing some games. I'm expecting Medium is going to get some play. Looking forward to some clans of Caledonia. Hoping to get at least three tables of gamers all having a great time. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the MM team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Blood Boiler, thank you. Evil John, thanks for the game for Sunday. That was a ton of fun. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and the portcullis is about to drop. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please continue tipping the bellhop at our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Visit your podcatchers and YouTube every Tuesday at 2 a.m. You can also catch the Bellhop Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on. on.